Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to day three of the West Coast Mandela Effect Conference 2019. I would also like everybody to go ahead and give yourselves a round of applause. You guys have been absolutely incredible. The questions, the interactions, the conversations I've personally had one-on-one -on -one with each and every one of you has been just absolutely amazing. So go ahead and give you guys a round of applause for yourself. Like I said, I can't get over how surreal this weekend has been. It's just been absolutely incredible. I'm still waiting to wake up from, from the dream and go, oh, man, really? <laughs> um, going forward, so we've heard about the history on the first day. We've heard about our personal experiences on the second day. So going forward, what are we going to do in the future? What have we learned here? And speaking of learned, don't forget your questionnaires at the end of the day. Uh, there's a couple questions on that back page, of course, you won't be able to answer until the end of the day. Uh, make sure you turn those in with us right in the back here. Did we get the internet one set up? Okay. We are going to try to set up an internet questionnaire to the best of my knowledge. Uh, we'll get the links out to that just as quickly as we can. Uh, but yes, please make sure you turn those questionnaires in. We're going to be going through those answers and see what kind of data we have retrieved. Uh, also, going forward, I was talking to one of our guests here, um, Mr. Alec. Can you stand up for me, Alec? This is Alec Sherman, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and Alec Sherman has done something for this community. Uh, we've talked a lot about consciousness, and Cynthia made a point that if you delve down to the bottom of every one of the theories that I've put up on, on the YouTube channel on Mandela Effect Theory Series. If you look into these, every one of them ends at consciousness. You might even go into simulation theory. I like how you said the other day, they've, they didn't go far enough. They need to go a little bit deeper. It's a simulation of consciousness. So does anybody here know what a random number generator is by show of hands? The whole room. I love it. That's awesome. <laughs> For those who are, who are at home, the whole room raised their hand simultaneously. It was great. Um, so he has created a random number generator website. It's called Theta Stream. It is absolutely free. Everybody, I please encourage go there once this is over. I don't want to see your cell phones in your hands right now. <laughs> I'm the show. No. Uh, <laughs> uh, but seriously, uh, he's created this application. It's got a couple of different games. And you said two games? It's got two games on it, and what you can do is test your consciousness against the random number generators and see if you can't control the random number that pops up. It's between upper 500 and lower 500, excluding the number zero, and it's, uh, what, one-minute test, I think you said? Yeah. One- to two-minute tests, and uh, you can go against other people on one of them. You can go against yourself or the algorithms. And see if you can't manipulate the con a random number generator with only using your consciousness. And if you think this sounds a little strange for those who might be listening at home and never heard something like this, actually, if you look into something called heartmath.org, or um, there's been a lot of physicists who have actually done these tests with the random number generators. During the 9-11 incident... No matter how you feel about 9-11, we're not digging into that. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, Twelve hours before the incident actually occurred, there was random number of generators that had been set up all over the world a little while prior to this to try to test this very theory. And uh, 12 hours prior to the attack, the number of generators started spiking. I mean incredibly spiking all over the world. There was no one area that was affected. The entire world was. And this showed that something was happening. Of course, we know what happened 12 hours later. It continued to spike for another 12 hours. That was the heaviest spike of data they've ever seen. It's also the heaviest thing that's ever happened in this world in our lifetime that's changed everything and every, the way we do things in this world. So there is a lot of solid evidence to back the idea that consciousness truly does affect the outside world like random number generators. So please go check out datastream.app. Uh, again, it is a website. They do have an app available. They are continually upgrading it. Um, I, like I said, I spoke with the programmer earlier. He's a really wonderful guy. 
and I hope everybody and everybody has a chance to check this out. It tracks your data, it tracks your scores, the whole nine yards. So please check that out, everybody. All right, moving forward, like I said, where would you guys like to see the community in five years? Do you think it's just going to be the ones that are sitting in this room? No. How about the ones that just watches online now? Think that'll be it? No. You think we're going to grow worldwide by then? I do too. We've got a lot of exposure lately. And as this grows, people are going to want answers. They're going to want to know what's going on. How did this happen? How is this happening? They're going to have a lot of fear. They're going to have a lot of questions. They're going to have a lot of worries. And you guys right now, the ones that have been in this effect for maybe the last two or three years, we're the pioneers. We are the front runners. We're the ones who have really done the time to research, to dig in, to find what's going on behind the scenes, to look in the physics and the quantum physics, to really delve down and see what we can find. We're the ones with those answers. We're the ones they're going to be coming to. Each one of you is going to become a pillar down the road. You're going to become a strong point for somebody who has just found this effect. Somebody who is scared out of their minds wondering what happened to their reality. Each and every one of you is going to be that strong point. Some of you have written books. Some of you are writing books. Some of us wish we could write a book <laughs> or had enough time in the day to think about one. <clears throat> Going forward, each and every one of us need to really be there for anybody who comes to us with questions about the effect. Anybody who's scared, make sure you let them know don't be scared. We've made it this far. We're okay. Maybe a little challenged by society, but who isn't? <laughs> so please keep that in mind. Anytime going forward, people are, we're going to have new people coming in this community all the time. All the time. I was on Twitter a week ago, and I was just scrolling through the feed. I don't even know who this person was. I'm not even you know part of their, their groups or whatever. And their uh, tweet was, I just found the Mandela effect. And I assure you, it's totally real. I'm mind blown. So I shared this. The love that this man got from the community, just that we have on Twitter, was incredible. The love that we felt during this whole conference has been incredible. I know every one of you has felt this kind of energy. And it's that energy moving forward that's going to help us all. It's that energy that we know has that that. that I don't even know the word I'm looking for at this moment. It's that energy that has that oomph, that, that gumption, that pushes us to go on, to the gusto. Great word. I, thank you, Isaac. Great word. It gives us the gusto to go on and research, to find out what's going on, to keep that drive. And it's that drive that others will see in us, that others will come make us, uh, will make others come to us and wonder, what do you know? How are you so calm about this? How can you handle this so easy? Why are you so nonchalant? Oh, yeah, it was always Berenstein. How can you do that? Because we've all been dealing with this for quite a while. So anytime you come across somebody new and they have questions, please take the couple moments out of your day to talk with them. That could really change their outlook on the entire world. That could mean the difference between sitting in a corner, curled up in a ball going, oh no, oh no, or walking out like this, like I am right now in confidence and speaking about it to the world. So please, as you go forward, if you run into people. Now, on that note, I've heard a lot of discussion in this community about whether we should tell other people about it. Should we wake people up or should we let them sleep? And the only thing I've got to say to that is be subtle. When I try to put it right in somebody's face, I might as well spit on them. It doesn't work. They walk away. They roll their eyes. They get that funny stare. <laughs> and then read the Wikipedia page to you word for word without it being in front of them. <laughs> so that's all I've got this evening, ladies and gentlemen. Please, going forward... Check out this app, this truthstream. Or I'm sorry, theta stream. App. Um, I'm going to be on there a lot. 
I'm not going to lie. This right here, random number generators, I love that. I'm going to be testing myself a lot. I failed, by the way. I tried one of these earlier. My score was zero. Alec did it. His score was 400. I'm just saying. <laughs> Somebody's a little more practiced than I am. But that goes to show, if you do practice at it, it does show a difference in the data. So going forward, please be there for people who come to you. People have questions, answer them, at least to the best of your knowledge. Care for them. Be there for them. And most of all, thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the stage, Cynthia Sue Larson. Yay, thank you so much. And what a great introduction to tonight's topic because tonight I'll be talking about the Mandela Affected Hero's Journey and how reality shifters will save the world. So if you've ever felt, maybe, that you're in the wrong world, I'd like you to consider that maybe you could ask if you might be here to help create a new one. You know I like to ask how good can it get, so it's really about that. What if you are here? But just in, sometimes things really bother all of us who are here. I think that's, I'm seeing nods. I felt that way too as soon as, when I was a little girl. I felt like wrong planet. I don't, I don't feel that way anymore, especially this weekend. I think this is the best sign of hope I've ever seen in my whole life. So thanks to you guys. Thanks to the YouTube community. And, you know, it's a huge thing that all of us are coming together like um, never before. So tonight, what I'll be talking about, the key ideas that I'll be presenting are the idea of the cosmic mind connection. And I think you'll recognize this image. Thank you, Shane. <laughs> I was trying to find, like, where does anyone do this correctly, the way we remember? And so thank goodness for YouTube and people like Shane, unbiased and on the fence. So we'll take a look at the cosmic mind connection, take a look at the quantum overview, then take a look at who are the Mandela Effect affected. I touched on that a little bit previously. And then the Mandela Effect hero's journey. What is that? Where is it going? What does it mean for each of us individually? And then how does the Mandela affected, how, how all of us can save the world. Okay, so you might remember if you were here that I handed out the pieces of paper. And that was just an initiation for some people. It may be new for you to kind of tune in and see what kind of things happen when you look at something before you look at it. It's just the experience of learning to listen, maybe scribble something. And I heard some feedback from people that got some really interesting results. If anybody, I don't know if anybody wants to share, but you're welcome to if you brave soul. Or you don't have to. Yes, thank you, Sherry. I've been open and I've like, um, went to the Monroe Institute. We're going to pass you a mic. Thank you, Sherry. I got the dolphin and I had went, I went to the Monroe Institute and I'm really into like Edgar Cayce and stuff. And both places have a labyrinth with dolphins on it there. And they do a dolphin energy healing from the Monroe Institute. And I'm part of that group. And Wow. Yeah. So it was deeply meaningful. <laughs> yeah. Thank awesome. you. Thank you. And um, so this is just something I heard from other people that got some extraordinary synchronicities. And you don't have to talk about what they were. Is it OK? OK, I got permission to share something. Thank you. OK, this is super cool because um, the images that you're looking at here, you'll notice there are 12 different animals. I was um, intuitively informed I would need 11 of them actual. So I got exactly 11, not all 12. I didn't actually get the dolphin. Um, I, I, was, I was intuitively receiving all this. I would need 11, and it was for a breakfast that, that we were yet to have with people I did not yet know exactly who would be there. I know some would be there, the others I didn't know for sure, to plan this event. And I brought these, and some of them I knew I got a very strong feeling give it to certain people. So for the people I've been given permission to talk about, I did get a very strong, um, very strong feeling to give this purple golden dragon to Christopher Anatra, the quantum businessman. And um, then interestingly, there were some that were randomly chosen, and I allowed people to choose 
Correct. And there was an exact uh, right number of animals for people that were there. And so in the case of Eleanor, she uh, reached in and drew one out, and it was the luck dragon, the white dragon. Okay, so that's what they actually got. That's the, so they have the actual physical little tiny things. Then they drew the paper piece, the pieces well, of paper. Jerry came around to hand it out. Okay, yes, right, right, right. Okay, so they did not select their pieces of paper. They were handed a piece of paper by Dark Wolf and then took a look to see what they got and guess what they got. Dragon. White dragon. Yes, white dragon, the luck dragon, and the purple and gold dragon. Wow. Yeah. Specifically highly unlikely. Exactly. And there are way more coincidences, if you want to call it that, with pretty much all of these. I, I, I would imagine that if you take a look at the piece of paper you got and look at what other people got, if they got the same thing, there may be messages there. There are levels of meaning. Remember earlier I said that there is no such thing as noise? I don't know if you remember that. That is really true. So you can actually look for levels and levels of meaning, and you'll find it. And, so, and you can start learning to cut through that noise with what Dark Wolf was talking about that Alec has provided. And you can play with things like random num number generators. So this, this is a question for you to think about. What connections can we find with one another and with various aspects of ourselves? And this is interesting. Um, some of you may have noticed a huge number of Mandela effects associated with certain people. One of them, it might be because he has so many movies to his name, is Tom Hanks. And um, he's got a new movie coming out, which I was startled to see. Actually, it's the, low, the last thing on the slide here, A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. I think it's coming out Thanksgiving this year. So it's a new movie. But if you hear the song, um, or we could all sing it together, it's a beautiful, beautiful day, day in the neighborhood. neighborhood. Thank you. OK. So you said um, the same thing that the movie is titled, but that's no longer how the song goes. It's now, and I can't even sing it because it sounds so wrong. Now it's, it's a beautiful day in this neighborhood. And on the little movie clip, you'll even see on public transportation, the entire, uh, looks like a whole group of people singing to Mr. Rogers, played by Tom Hanks. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. They're singing it as if that's the right thing. Talk about uh, residue. Okay, but some other examples have to do with life is a, like a box of chocolates. And Houston, we have a problem. There's a snake in my boot. <laughs> it's hard to say that with a straight face. And then cast away and cast away. So if you're not familiar with these, you can look them up. But I think what's fascinating is sometimes there will be an individual that just seems to be like the Higgs boson, the massive attractor of these things. And I did actually invite Tom Hanks to come here this weekend. I did talk to his publicist via email, and he was unavailable. But, you know, think about it. He's got this movie coming out, and I think she's aware of the fact that, oh my goodness, we've got a massive Mandela effect happening with the movie that she's promoting. I, don't, I think that would steal some of the thunder, or, you know, it's going to mess things up slightly for their publicity campaign. So not a big surprise he didn't come to this one, but we did invite him. Okay, this slide, I want you to get, uh, you don't have to look at all the detail. It's basically showing on the far left uh, an illustration of some of the areas of classical physics. Um, and don't worry about the details here. Uh, what I'm presenting is just all the various aspects of physics that scientists are looking at. You've heard of relativity and ideas having to do, this is pretty small for me to look at, but we've got the um, you know, special theory of relativity, the general theory of relativity, and then down below is quantum physics um, with all the various weird spooky action at a distance, quantum field theory, which is a really cool thing, um, the standard model, and, and I was talking about Higgs bosons and so forth. This is kind of a cute illustration. It's showing the so-called chasm of ignorance, and then the future where they're hoping everything will come together. And um, up in the upper right, there's a whole area of philosophy. So philosophy is another section or an area having to do with the nature of reality and looking at um, just all those aspects of free will that have been coming up in this conference as well. Do we have free will? If we get uh, precognitive insights about 9-11, is this foretold? Is there any way it could have been averted? Things like that come up. Um, I'm not answering the question, but I'm saying with all of these different aspects of physics, when we talk about a theory of everything, we're talking about bring this all together. And for me personally, um, I've been doing a lot of looking at the 
how to bring this together. And what I'm noticing, if I'm going to go to the next slide, this is a philosopher I really like a lot. This is Nicholas Rescher. I think he's still alive. He's in his 80s. And he, he's basically an optimist like I am, basically follows the Leibnizian approach of um, we're living in a really good place and nature is working positively to bring good things forward. I think those of us who are Mandela affected will do well to take that kind of same optimistic philosophy. What he says is the quantum view of reality demolished the most substance oriented of all ontologies, classical atomism. So what he's really saying is physicalism, this obsession that we have with saying that only what's physical is real, and if you can't hold it in your hands, measure it with a ruler, or weigh it, or some other kind of measurement, it's not really there. Um, he's basically saying that has been blown apart by quantum physics. It's, and um, that's true. Something else about this um, approach of looking at science philosophically is you can start noticing that some of the things we take for scientific truth, like saying that there's such a thing as objectivity, that happens to be a very philosophical perspective. That's not actually scientific to assume that you can have objectivity and there's only one reality. There's only one truth. If you want to think of it as only one timeline or whatever, that's not really what's happening. And that's, that's the way that these philosophers are showing us that. We also have some renegade physicists. This is back when they were renegades. They're going a little more mainstream, but back in the day, the guy on the left is David Jennings, and he said nature functions in a quantum manner. And I'll be going more into detail on that tonight. And then the other, the gentleman on the right, is Matthew Leifer, and he says, we now have a range of precise statements showing that whatever the ultimate laws of nature are, they cannot be classical. This is very important, so just keep that in mind. So if you're going to fit something into something, you're not going to squeeze quantum physics into classical reality or any other part of that other picture. It's going to be the other way around. And what I'm saying, and I wrote a paper to this effect, nature may be fundamentally quantum. I believe it really is. And I think we're seeing increasing evidence to this effect every day. And I'll be presenting a lot of it tonight. Certain aspects of quantum physics can never admit a classical understanding, as we heard earlier. Quantum logic matches human behavior. I've interviewed scientists and experts in this area that absolutely prove it mathematically with um, very advanced um, mathematics and so forth. It's that book I mentioned on Friday by Jerome Busemeyer. Excellent book. And then human memory appears to operate through quantum information retrieval. So what I'm saying is classical deductive logic is a subset, it's a special case of deductive logic. So we think of it left and right brain, but in a way, um, you want your heart to lead and you want the brain to be the faithful servant. That's another way to look at it. I think I'm seeing some nods here, so it makes sense. Lead with the heart, lead with the intuition, and we actually do this anyway. So it's kind of our natural tendency, but sometimes we fight against it. So what is quantum logic? This happens to be the internal workings of one of these great quantum computers. Now we've got Google, I think this month, claiming they've achieved quantum supremacy. IBM saying, oh, no, you didn't. You know, but there's always that stuff going on. It doesn't matter about when it happens. It's going to happen. And that supremacy simply means that the quantum computers are going to take the lead in being able to successfully deal with problems in a faster, more efficient way than any classical computer could. And so um, this is going to be coming more and more normal for us. We'll see quantum computers coming. And so we need to understand what it is. A um, simple way to look at it, it means be mindful of possibilities. So you want to be aware that quantum physics is dealing with that. Um, the, it deals with qubits, which work. Um, it's like flipping a coin. If you're working with classical physics, you would flip that coin, and you're going to get heads or tails, right? If you're dealing with a quantum computer, it's kind of like you're flipping 100 coins that are all entangled with each other. And they're in a superposition of states. And they're both heads, heads and tails until someone observes something. And then the entire entangled system decides what it's going to be. OK, so just because something appears to have happened doesn't mean we need to panic or be upset. This is a new finding that um, we are experiencing with the Mandela effect. We're seeing it with flip-flops. We're literally witnessing it happening. On some level, we'll be tuned into all possible realities playing out around us in possible presents, futures, and pasts. 
And I think we saw uh, a, some, a slide very similar to this yesterday, um, where you take a look at something from various viewpoints and perspectives, and you can see something different. Is it a square? Is it a circle? Is it a triangle? They can all be true. And with the Mandela effect, we're noticing sometimes when we talk to our loved ones, they remember a different history. Heard an extraordinary real life example of that yesterday. But off, I think most of us, if you question your childhood friends, your siblings, you'll find out they don't remember things the way that you remember them. Things are different. And Marcus Aurelius said, everything we hear is an opinion, not a fact. Everything we see is a perspective, not the truth. You could kind of flip that around though, because scientists are now finding these are a sort of truths. And they can all be true simultaneously. So we're upgrading that. Here's some recent findings about quantum thinking, even huge molecules like these that were, um, this is a paper from the University of Vienna published in September of 2019. And these uh, quantum-like properties are being observed in enormous molecules and they're being observed being in two places at once. Again, the technology is pushing, is leading the charge forward so we can get the quantum computers that we want. So that's why this research is being done. That means even huge molecules are following quantum rules. Some other exciting news is that this year, a quantum experiment suggests there is no such thing as objective reality. I think I said that on Friday. This, I think, is the biggest news story of the year. I love it. Totally ties in with the Mandela effect. And physicists at Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh and University of Vienna provided real evidence that you can have two observational systems that are trusted, both at the same time, same place, getting two very different um, truths. I think we all need to know that you can influence others through quantum steering. We can entangle with those we care about, with those we love, and you can change things. Um, you want to be gentle and not pushy about it. We wouldn't want to be pushed around, so um, it's interesting to notice. So in this system, you're looking at a steering task, and it works with um, this idea of quantum steering that was originally introduced by Erwin Schrödinger. This is back in 1935 when quantum physics was quite new. And he was using it to describe entanglement that would allow an experimenter to non-locally have an effect or steer another system's states through local measurements. It's like um, non-local prayer, you may have heard of that. So it's kind of like that, although these are scientists and they're not doing that kind of thing, but that is kind of what they're doing. Um, Schrodinger emphasized that the state arrived at depends quite decidedly on what measurements one chooses to take, not only on the results they yield. So uh, this is kind of detailed and specific, but it's kind of like the way you look at things matters. And sometimes it helps to just kind of get back into that field of possibilities, take a break, come back to something when you're feeling more positive. I definitely recommend that. How far these tangled systems go is kind of like that uh, story about it's tortoises all the way down. <laughs> I, that's a good question. How far does it go? And this gets into what's the cause of the Mandela effect? What's causing it? What's really going on here? And you just keep going down, down, down. Just like reality, just like consciousness. So here's Henry Stapp, who I mentioned previously. And he is one of the scientists that was doing a random number generator study, working with those martial artists to change um, the, the, the numbers, they were looking at green and red lights, just kind of focusing, you just want to make them all green, you want to make them all red. They were random, but they could seriously tilt the results that had happened previously based on ticker tapes of previously recorded random number generation from some time in the past. And they're changing it. You can have a retrocausal re effect. So it was a retrocausality study with a random number generator. And they were quite good at it. <laughs> so, I mean, this is cool stuff. So here we, what? That's amazing. It is amazing. It's totally amazing, yes. That, and you know, earlier I said, just because something appears to have happened, don't panic. Really, and I mean it. You know, just kind of, just be like, oh, okay, it looks like that. And we've seen things flip-flop. We're in this community. We know this happens. We know it happens. So Henry Stapp says, nature is ontologically like a cosmic mind, like a Whiteheadian type mind that in, contains potential for future experiences. So here he is talking, he can't, I guess he can't say God, I know Henry Stapp, I know he believes in God, but the scientists, they, they very seldom use that word. They'll use other words, um, you know, like a census taker, like what's that? What do you mean by that? Usually they mean God. <laughs> but it's so not cool to say that, so they can't say it. So a cosmic mind is another way to look at it, and 
Um, so nature and cosmic mind really love quantum processes. Um, they have extraordinary efficacy. You'll see it in the placebo effect. You'll see it in embodied cognition. You'll see it with um, scientific constants that vary. They don't stay the same. They actually move around. You'll see evolution moving in jumps. Just like, just jump into the right thing instantly. You'll see that we live in a fine-tuned universe and numerous examples of natural processes exist. So if you're not familiar with it already, the placebo effect is quite extraordinary. And I do get into this in Quantum Jumps, my book, because um, it's phenomenal. It, not only is it very effective, but the placebo simply means I shall please. And one of the earliest times it was ever studied was under war times. It was World War II. And there in London, the doctors did not have enough pain relief medication in their medical bags. They had water, they had salt, and they came up with an idea. We'll make a saline solution, and we'll pretend it's something. We'll care for our wounded. We care deeply for them. We need to win this war. So we're going to give them something. We're going to give them salt water. And the I shall please idea um, was proven in that wartime condition to work. So it was one of the first tests of the idea. But actually, doctors have been using it for a long time, just never so in such a focused way. Subsequently, it has become a standard practice for the pharmaceutical industry to use the placebo test. And it's very upsetting for them, I would assume, that um, the efficacy of placebos has pretty much doubled in the past 30 years in the United States. It's off the charts if you happen to have faith in God. Then you can way go way, 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 way above doubling. So it goes from something like a 30% effect to a 60. If you have faith, then you can get to 80, 95% of efficacy. So if you believe in God and you believe placebo effect works, yay. You can get some <laughs> really, and I do. You know, it's cool stuff. This really works. Um, and it's been proven to work on things like not getting enough sleep. You just tell yourself, I got enough sleep. If you feel like you're catching a cold, I feel great. You can reverse out of things and a lot more. So, um, and actually, I wanted to also mention that currently a majority of doctors were surveyed and they, a majority admitted, yeah, we, pres we prescribe placebos. Because you get that patient, what are you going to do? Want to give them something. We don't have the right thing, but we'll give them something. So it could be a sugar pill or whatever, but a lot of people do get better. This works for animals. It's been proven to work for horses and dogs. I mentioned earlier that our dog um, underwent something like a placebo effect of sorts. But the studies that have been done were specifically for arthritis for dogs, and I think something similar for horses. And um, they absolutely improved. And this is with like triple blind studies, quadruple blind studies, where nobody quite knows which group they're in. And are they getting the real thing for their pet, their beloved animal? And they don't know, the doctor doesn't know, the person doing the, re the comparison doesn't know and huge positive results. But I think those are social animals, so they're highly entangled with the people. If you're wondering why is that happening, that's my guess. Um, there are s placebo studies happening right now with universities, so hopefully we'll get more information. Embodied cognition is the science of doing something, like you can make a fist or open your fingers wide and get the benefit of willpower. You can smile. If you don't feel like smiling, just put a pencil in your mouth. I hope it's clean. <laughs> and you're going to feel better. <laughs> Laughing works. Um, you know, if you want to be smart or follow physics discussions, just put your fingers up, point to your head. It actually makes you smarter. My mom is a kindergarten teacher, and she used to tell her kids before they took one of those standardized tests, just tap your head. And I, I, I don't know if she knew it worked or what, but it totally works. You know, maybe it's the stimulation, the blood circulation, but pointing, it helps. It's been proven to help. These are tested, um, laboratory tested, proven things. Now, this is fascinating. Um, some studies, in fact, a lot of studies um, cannot be reproduced. We expect that in science, if you have an experiment, you should be able to get the same results given the same basic um, protocol. However, there is a reproducibility crisis occurring where more than two-thirds of researchers have tried and failed to reproduce another scientist's experiments. And that was just a small little thing that I saw in the news, um, but this was a survey published in the journal Nature. More than 70% of researchers tried and failed. That's huge. So what is that telling us? Are things changing based on expectation, based on who the observer is? It looks like it to me. 
And Rupert Sheldrake has done some extraordinarily excellent work in this area. His book, Science Set Free, points out that some of the so-called constants that we think, I mean, when you think of a constant, what is that? Like the gravitational constant? That's Isaac Newton's gravitational constant. We've had this for a long time. And now we've got um, NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Um, in 1998, they were publishing values of that gravitational constant, and it was showing a range between 6.73 and 6.64, just a few months later. You don't expect something like that to happen to your constant. I mean, this is ridiculous, right? But why aren't we hearing about this? Well, thanks to Rupert Sheldrake, we are. And this is happening not just to that, but a whole bunch of so-called deviant measurements are being thrown out. Like, well, we're not gonna talk about that. <laughs> Things are changing. <laughs> so they've been noticing, the scientists have been noticing the Mandela effect for years. I want you to know that, I want you to know it. And Rupert Sheldrake, I don't know if he called it that, but this is what's happening. So pay attention. And another place it's happening, if you want to know, evolution. And when they talk about we can't find the so-called missing link, you hear this all the time, right? How many times have you heard that? Oh, yeah. A lot. So there is another theory which has to do with um, punctuated equilibrium, which means that fossils of each intermediate species appear fully distinct, persist unchanged, and then become extinct. Transitional forms are unknown. That is cool. <laughs> that means we're, going, we're doing quantum jumps in evolution on the planet of every species. So, um, with the idea that we can experience alternate histories, uh, obviously this could help explain the fine-tuned universe, if you've ever heard of that, just how incredibly unlikely this universe is. You hear this from a lot of theologians, um, they're the ones that really come in strong saying there must be a God because it's so fine-tuned. It's outrageous. So you hear that. Sometimes skeptics don't want to accept that. They're like, well, that's just random chance. But this is why I like philosophers like Nicholas Rescher, who's like, he doesn't even get into the God thing. He just shows you like, nah, this is absolutely working that way, and that's the way nature operates. I love that. So it gives you something for your other side of your brain to chew on <laughs> if you're having trouble with God for the moment. And what I love is that nature is already better at doing some of the things we want our compu quantum computers to do. Guess who's doing it first? Nature is. So we're seeing optimization problems being solved. Um, these are some of the things that we're going to see solved by the quantum computers. And if you look to um, swarms of or hives, you know, that hive consciousness, you'll see bees and ants are coordinating and cooperating together. And that swarm intelligence is really a good example of uh, following simple rules with a centralized control system and uh, intelligent energies. One thing that shocked a lot of physicists is why are we observing that starlings are moving like liquid helium? They, uh, what was expected is if you photograph the starlings, those flocks of birds, they're just moving just really fast. You've seen how beautiful it looks. And so they slowed it down, they looked closely, like they figured, okay, there's gonna be a bird, one bird that starts signaling the turn and then everyone else follows. That's what they expected to see. That's not what's happening. They're absolutely moving exactly, exactly together. And that is simulating what goes on in things like um, superfluid helium, which is something you'd be working with if you're working on a quantum computer. Nature's already doing this. Uh, sheep dogs, when they herd sheep, are using the kind of rules that you need when you're going to be programming a quantum computer. Um, they first collect the sheep together till the group is cohesive, which is a quantum concept, and then they drive the cohesive group in the desired direction. They know what they're doing. And so they're getting them like a flock of starlings, and then they drive them. And computer models are starting to use the same two-step method for large groups of more than 50 members, and it works fantastically well. And quantum coherence, I mean, you may have heard of this one. Photosynthesis is extremely efficient at taking a, ray, a photon of light and taking, uh, it's like solving the New York rush hour traffic problem and transporting that little photon to where that energy needs to be stored in the organism, the plant. It always chooses the quickest path cho um, that's possible. Well, something like 95 nine, you know, percent of the time. That's so far above any of our photovoltaic technology right now. 
So when we get to quantum, we can start matching it. We don't have it yet, but that's what it's going to take to catch up with nature. Quantum biologists are suggesting that our DNA itself is mutating through quantum superposition. And this is from the book um, by Jim L. Kalali, the physicist, and John Joe McFadden. Uh, these guys were on the bleeding edge of quantum biology. <laughs> they co-authored a book by that name, Quantum Biology. And I've, had, um, I've interviewed John Joe McFadden on my Living the Quantum Dream podcast. He's brilliant. And so what they're doing is they're leading pioneers saying, this is what's happening before it's absolutely proven. And what's happening in pretty much every case is being proven. So uh, what's happening is qu uh, quantum superposition is like that cat that's alive and dead at the same time. It's like being in two places. And that's the way DNA is um, able to give rise to new species and in the short term can lead to healing from diseases, instantaneous remission from diseases that might have been considered incurable. We heard about that yesterday. Enzymes are able to speed biochemical reactions, and they're using quantum teleportation. So if you've ever had a Mandela effect where something was in a different place, I have. Like I know I put something down. That's how I started my Reality Shifters website, is you put your keys down and then they move. Your socks aren't in the dryer. I've had magazines move. I've had everything you can imagine move, you know, and people notice this too. It happens because it's a quantum process. So quantum tunneling with the enzymes is enhanced by vibrational protein motions. Okay, it might be enhanced. This is also the work of John Joe McFadden. I believe he's right. So I think everything he's suggesting, his track record is phenomenal. So I think he's on the right track. I think we're going to get proof of this. And we're starting to see that, um, you know, there's this very, it's kind of like warm, wet, messy biological processes. And the reason this is so shocking is, is physicists thought you'll never see quantum phenomena happening in nature. Well, guess what? We are. On every level, every scale, all the warm, wet, messy stuff, it's still happening. That's good news for us Mandela Effect experiencers. <laughs> okay, so who are the Mandela Affected? And uh, this is a picture from Quantum Jumps based on a survey I did a couple of times. I've done the survey. Um, when people notice reality shifts, and that would be when something appears, disappears, transforms, transports, or a Mandela effect, but it might be a personal Mandela effect. Um, the biggest response people tend to have is curiosity in the people that I surveyed, and I surveyed hundreds of people. The next biggest response is awe, just a state of, whoa, what's happening here? Um, followed by excitement, like woohoo, it was really exciting. And happiness, a lot of happiness and joy. And then 10% uh, are confused, 1% are scared, and I got such a small percent that were actually angry. Occasionally people get angry, like, why'd you do that? <laughs> but that happens too. So these are emotional responses. And who we are, I talked about this on Friday a little bit. If you look at the Myers-Briggs, you get some interesting insights that um, the personality type distribution in the general population would be, um, t the, the biggest percentage group is the ISFJs. These are sensor, sensing, feeling, judging people who are uh, introverted. That's 13.8%. And then ESFJs, ISTJs, and so forth. I know the writing is small. But the intuitive feelers that are the majority over here of the Mandela affected, um, that would be your ENFPs, INFPs, INFJs. Those guys are way down here. They're, they're like the two percenters, the one percenters. They are really rare, supposedly. But in our community, they're the norm. So if you look at what this means, um, the E stands for extroverted, the I is introverted. And these are tendencies, so if you take the test and it's on the borderline, that's okay. Sensors and intuitives, thinkers or feelers, judges or perceivers. perceivers. So it's kind of an either-or thing, which is not very quantum, I know. But um, it gives you sort of a generality, and you got an idea. And again, we're noticing, um, you know, these intuitive feelers are a really huge percentage of our Mandela community. INFP, INFJ, ENFP, that's the majority of who we are as a group. And then if you look at what this means, this gets interesting. And I've got something funny up here. It may be too tiny to see. If you like Harry Potter, we've got Ravenclaw in blue, <laughs> Slytherin in green, <laughs> Hufflepuff in yellow, and Gryffindor over in red. 
So <laughs> it's funny, um, you know, but it's just being playful with it. And again, if you want to know where are we, a lot of the intuitive feelers, so it would be right up here in Gryffindor, you know, we're heroes. We are courageous. We're willing to stand up for what's right. That means we're advocates. We're mediators. And if you look at, um, you know, I think that's, there's also a protagonist over here, ENFJ, and a campaigner, ENFP. Heavy, heavy Gryffindor personalities. It's just fun. Okay, more seriously. <laughs> That's just the fun part. Uh, if you want to know what would they call it if you're talking to a psychologist, um, then it would be more like uh, idealists and healers. Idealists, these are idealists. Gryffindor are idealists. And the color changed, but never mind that. Um, then you've got idealists who are counselors, champions, teachers, and healers. Good news, we're teachers. Right when the world needs us, what are we doing? We're teaching, we're healing, we're counseling, we're championing. We're the right place and the right time, the right people. This is the right team. And there are other people that experience Mandela effects as well. So I'm not saying it's just that, but it's a pretty heavy percentage. Okay, so here's a picture of Joseph Campbell. I used to watch a great TV show with, um, maybe, maybe you've seen it, yeah. So he was on a PBS series and he went through this beautiful story of how the human experience can be seen through all the cultures of the world. And you can see that there's this, these archetypes that Carl Jung talked about, but it's in the stories, uh, you know, the mythology. So he's like the, the king of mythology. Joseph Campbell said, the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure that you seek. And he talked about, you are the hero of your own story. So we're gonna look at that tonight. What does that look like for our community? Well, here's the hero's journey, and it starts up at the top with a call to adventure. Then we meet some mentors. We cross some kind of a threshold where there's like no going back. I think we know that feeling. <laughs> <laughs> then we have trials, sometimes failures, growth and new skills, death and rebirth. Don't worry about the death. I mean, it's, just, it's kind of like a you know, death of some aspect of what you used to be. Uh, revelation, changes, atonement. You get some gifts and you return changed. I'm going to go through each of these. And here's Star Wars. Everybody knows Star Wars, right? <laughs> okay, so the call to adventure when Luke Skywalker is called forth, um, you know, he, I think that there's just this moment. You must learn the ways of the Force if you're to come with me to Alderaan. That's what Obi-Wan Kenobi said to Luke. Or that's what he says now, <laughs> I think. <laughs> anyway, uh, the call to adventure is often initially refused because it, it challenges everything you are. You don't want to make some crazy new change. Often further circumstances provide that kind of kick in the pants that we need. We may not like it, but you can kind of come along nicely or you can come along. And I sure got a kick in the pants. I talked about this time that I was walking with two friends from my corporate world. That was a coming out of sorts to me. We didn't have a quantum businessman. There was no example. <laughs> Uh, you know, I was, I was like, oh my gosh, this is happening to me. And right in front of these people I used to work for, you know, at a top 500 company in the United States, high level managers, very high. And I'm talking about this stuff. And then right in front of our eyes, we get an example. And I'm like, so relieved. I mean, I knew they didn't think I was crazy, but I was starting to have doubts. Like the stuff I'm talking about, we're talking back in the 1980s, the 1990s. This is a long time ago. I was nervous, but sure enough, the sundial showed up out of nowhere. My friends corroborated, and they are high-level senior people in the banking world. What a relief. And then I thought, uh-oh, now I'm out, you know? It's like, <laughs> I've just outed myself. I better do something with this. That was my, we didn't have YouTube. You have to remember where we were at the time. So when we meet our mentors, we get an opportunity to hear advice, such as Obi-Wan Kenobi gives, Many of the truths we cling to depend greatly on our own point of view. And we're seeing that in our community. So these mentors make a big difference once the journey begins. And we're leaving the safe, familiar comfort of what we thought was true. And it's just a memory. These are some of my mentors. Thank goodness, thank God for them. So these are people that, it's me with them through the years. Fred Allen Wolf, a good friend, excellent physicist. He was in What the Bleep Do We Know? Cleve Baxter, the author of Primary Perception, he's the one that worked on plant consciousness. Brilliant man. And that is an energy field, that's an aura behind our heads right there. That was a regular camera catching an aura picture. 
Uh, that's Larry Dossie, brilliant man. He writes about non-local prayer. You can pray for other people, it totally works. Bruce Lipton, early in the day, before he was the big guy he is now. That was ages ago. Stanley Krippner, another genius, uh, giant in the field, working with consciousness, dreams, paying attention to dreams and dreams we share, and how that's really real. He is a king of that field. PMH Atwater, I told you, she's the author of that book, Future Memory. First person that I know of currently may change, but to mention the term, reality shifts. Henry Stapp, I keep talking about him all the time. He believes in free will. He knows we make a choice. He knows that how you observe makes a difference. And he's seen some weird stuff around me. Um, Dean Radin loves weird stuff, studies it at Institute of Noetic Sciences. And so these are some of my mentors. Thank God for them. Because back in the day, 20 years ago, thank God, I had somebody. You know, and there's my team. I don't have Obi-Wan Kenobi, but you bring them together and, you know. <laughs> and so we got each other. You know, but by the way, I want to go back because you may wonder, who do we have? We have you guys. I am so grateful to all of you, everybody who's here today, and especially the YouTube channels, um, the authors, people who are brave enough to come forward and take a look at this with everybody because you're helping lead the way. Okay, now crossing a threshold into the unknown. This was a cool scene in the, in the movie. These aren't the droids you're looking for. You can go about your business. <laughs> what a great example of that entanglement we were talking about and quantum steering. Perfect example of being the observer outside of the other observers and just moving things. And you can do it with love. You can, we do this with love. At some point, we get an unmistakable sense that we're now in a completely different territory. We have crossed a threshold. And what does that feel like? Well, here's a picture that shows what many of us feel like it feels like. Uh, here's a cat. I aspire to be as calm as this cat when things are falling apart around me. <laughs> We've all been there. <laughs> like I, to get ready for this talk, I was going back to my book, Quantum Jumps, to find the, the research that's, that's covered on the very cover of the book. And I spent like three and a half, four hours on it. Guess what? It's not in the book. It's not. And it was. It may, it'll probably show up again. I think it just did that to play with me. But, but you know, you got to stay calm when this stuff happens. You can't let it freak you out. you got to be like, oh, that's all right. It may flip-flop. So um, walking in both worlds can feel unsettling. Experimenting, experiencing the flip-flops and the reality residue can be kind of a weird thing at first. But then you start coming into your high sense perception and you start trusting that, trusting your heart, trusting your intuition, trusting that other side of the brain that the thinker originally showed us. So the next step is trials, tribulations, and helpers. Because it doesn't just get easy from there. You might think it would, right? <laughs> Things are falling apart. No, we know better. Um, never tell me the odds is what Han Solo says. So helpers on the journey, they can be a little offbeat. They might be a little unusual. They're characters, right? <laughs> we are, you know, maybe a little different than the norm, that's okay. Because we bring those unique perspectives and we help each other. And I remember the fully gold C-3PO. This is weird with the silver leg. And I, was a, I went to the original Star Wars. I was going to the uh, Cal Expo that day with my best friend. And we both are sci-fi buffs. We see the movie, the premiere, the, the opening you know, weekend. We just go right into the theater. Then we watch it, it ends. And we just look at each other. We didn't know what we're thinking. We're not leaving the theater. We're going to watch it again. I think we watched it over and over, and then we couldn't take the bus back home. We're kids. Like, uh-oh, whose dad do we call? <laughs> you know, better not call mine, I said. So we called hers, and he was ticked off, but it, it was better. <laughs> so, anyway, okay. Um, so my trials, tribulations, and helpers, um, I've had some bumps on the road, too, a whole bunch. Early on, I started this Reality Shifters newsletter, and I hit some snags reaching out to some communities that may have had other viewpoints. We've all been through that. I don't need to bore you with the details. But when you find your tribe of helpers, that's essential. We need helpers. We need a community. We're stronger together. We need to learn from others' experiences, share those firsthand reports, thoughts, feelings, and ideas. So that's what I've been doing. A lot of us are doing that with our channels. Next is growth and new skills. So here's a scene from the movie with the lightsaber. If you remember, now Obi-Wan Kenobi has suggested try fighting against this artificial intelligence anti-gravity flying ball um, by just covering your eyes. Use the force, Luke. Your eyes can deceive you. Don't trust them. 
I think that speaks to the whole left brain, right brain thing and what we can measure versus what we can feel. This movie was spot on and you may wonder, well, how did it get things so right? Well, uh, the director consulted with Joseph Campbell and really got familiar. I'm using this as an example for a reason. This movie was shaped around the hero's journey. That's how it's so good. If you wonder what happened to the other ones, I don't know. I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, this was great. So um, when you develop your high sense perception, you've got a gift. And you can start really depending on it. Like those animals that I brought, I brought exactly 11. They went, it was amazing. And then the piece of paper that you got, that just give it time. If you feel like, I don't know what that was. Some people are telling me they're giving it time and something amazing is happening. So there is no such thing as noise. Growth and new skills has to do with lucid living, quantum jumping, reality selection. It's living in that blissful state, usually, once you get good at it. There are a lot of falls getting there, but once you get past the stumbles and, you know, just trust, trust the process, you'll get better. It gets good. And then we come into death and rebirth and initiation. And here's a scene from the trash compactor. It's kind of like, you know, that's a weird smell we got here. <laughs> And C-3PO says, we're doomed. So it becomes increasingly obvious there's no going back. Maybe a, a relationship comes to an end. Maybe things change with when you tell people at work. It's happened to all of us, you know. It, it's, this is tough, but you gotta stay the course and get strong because better times are coming. It's, this is sort of like the low point. <laughs> it does get a lot better. And here's a picture um, just showing that for us in the Mandela Effect community, we can recognize the magnitude and significance of changes that we observe. And we can realize that we can't return to going back to living as we had before. Can't really go back. I think we, all of us have wanted to, you know, honestly, <laughs> but it can't. So then we hit the phase of revelation and transformation. Here's Yoda saying, you must unlearn what you have learned. This is a hard one, right? We've learned about classical reality, materialism, oh, objectivity. There's only one real history, right? We heard that. We, we assumed it. We now know that is not true. And we're starting to see some good evidence that, sh that can back that up. But revision of beliefs is a key essential part of new revelation and transformation. So if you're feeling like my world's falling apart, it's getting rebuilt. So you're getting stronger. Just like a sword that gets forged by all the folds, you're getting stronger. And here's a quote by Joseph Campbell having to do with revelation and transformation. People say that what we're all seeking is a meaning for life. I don't think that's what we're really seeking. I think that what we're seeking is an experience of being alive so that our life experiences on the purely physical plane will have resonance with our own innermost being and reality so that we actually feel the rapture of being alive. Yeah, this guy could be really deep. I love that. It feels real, you know. This is not false memory. This is not some computer simulation and you're just a glitch in the machine or something. You're more than that, much more. So reality shifts and the Mandela effect can initiate pursuit of a spiritual path and awakening. We heard a lot about that yesterday. Thank you guys. And also the first day. So we wanna focus away from fears which can be magnetic. And an example of that, one of the two people, the senior high level person in the financial world, I went for a walk one day and we saw so many snakes in the park near my house that I'd never seen so many six foot snakes. These things were huge, as big around as my arm. And I asked, are you afraid of snakes? I'm like deathly afraid, like no wonder. <laughs> like I've never seen so many. It's kind of like they feel the fear and they're like, here I am, you know. So you want to pay attention. It's like when you learn to ride a motorcycle, you get the advice, don't look down at the pothole. You're going to hit it for sure. You got to keep your eye on the horizon where you want to go. And we got to do that collectively and individually. And you can discover your unique gift, service, and your role. And then the good news, we return home, master of many worlds. I mean, this is what it should look like, you know, ideally, right? It hasn't happened yet for most of us. <laughs> it will, hang in there, it will. Uh, respect and recognition ideally should be granted when we return home. Keep in mind, as Dark Wolf keeps telling us, this is new. We are what the UFO community used to be. We do not yet have the level of respect that we should be getting. We will. I know we will. Chewbacca used to get a medal. Oh, that's another big one, yeah. Chewbacca used to get a medal. 
I know. And now, and now what happened? He's like, what about me? <laughs> and I think, I think that's because we're feeling that way. <laughs> yeah, we're all feeling that way. Where's our medal? How come, how come we're not getting accolades? We will. I know it. But meanwhile, I love this. This is very funny. I saw this picture on the internet, social media. On the left, me trying to explain the multidimensional nature of reality and how you can shift between them. My family. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's so perfect. <laughs> I think we can all relate. So, um, but you know what the good news is? I've been doing this for 20 years and it's really weird. I don't push my family. I don't tell them anything, but then it's starting to change in a really pa positive way by embodying and sharing these gifts, being generous with it, not pushy, then, and listening. I listen a lot. And you start getting through what seemed like an obstacle. You're making more of a, of a difference than any of you know by your example. And so here's some good news for, um, you'll see here Jean Houston. Many of you know her. For her 80th birthday, I was contacted by a screenwriter, Sherry Steinkellner, who wanted to help write a play about this very topic, about what is it like. So it was a... This, um, the idea in the story was an astrophysicist, an anthropologist, and an actress walk into a theater when a quantum shift causes their stages to converge and the audience to vanish, then they pool their collective resources. And it's a very personal story for Jean Houston and things that actually happen in her life. I don't know if it'll ever come onto the stage in general. It's made a couple of appearances. If you ever see it, it's cool. And I was um, contacted as a resource, a very primary resource for the development of this project. And that was cool. That's cool to get that kind of respect. But of course, that is Jean Houston. Of course she knows this is going on. So never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. That's Margaret Mead. And so from my perspective, um, if you're wondering how do these things tie together, what's the difference between like a quantum jump? Um, I've got sort of this arbitrary line of demarcation. It's really not that cut and dry, but it's good to give you an idea that conscious jumps would be quantum jumps where you're really fully choosing where you're going to be going. When things sort of randomly happen, then that would be what I've been calling reality shifts. Like what the heck just happened here? The history changed, and that's definitely the Mandela effect when you've got the larger number of group experiencers. However, you can have personal Mandela effects and you can have large-scale reality shifts. So there's a great power of we in the me, in the Mandela effect, with truly amazing instant global and universal reality shifts. What do I mean? Well, we can witness instantaneous change. It is faster than continental drift. We're getting Mandela effects that are so fast. It's faster than cosmic expansion. It's faster than species evolution. I mean, it's faster than any way that we've ever heard about that these things can change. How fast is it? It's fast as lightning. It's faster than lightning. It's instant. So continental drift, I think we've covered this with um, the excellent presentation on the geography presented by Shane, unbiased and on the fence, basically. And you've got to see the, how his own recollection changed. This is another um, artist's rendition of the way one other person remembered it used to be. So if you're crossing the Panama Canal, it didn't used to go north-south. It was a lot more east-west, for example, other things like that. Whole South American continent seems to have moved. Um, things like this can happen, and when did that happen? How fast did that happen? How come no one noticed? Uh, that's sort of a feature of the Mandela effect. Some people say that they remember we were on a different part of, <laughs> of the, the universe, that, that um, basically we're now in the Orion section, no longer Sagittarius. Again, I don't think that was a slow process. <laughs> it was just like suddenly, boom, there we are. <laughs> this one gets a lot of the martial artists that I work with. If I want to convince them, this is my favorite way. I say, okay, you guys now. What do you avoid hitting so that you don't do a kidney punch? Oh, and I'm like, show me. Show me on someone. Oh, it's so much fun. Because they're going to show you <laughs> where it used to be. And, and they, they're looking at you like, this is right, right? And I'm like, yeah, that's where it used to be. And they're like, what do you mean used to be? <laughs> well, check it now. Check it now. Take a look. And so this affected like 7.7 .7 billion people on the planet instantaneously. 
The kidneys are now in a safer location, kind of tucked under a little bit more protection of the rib cage. It no longer makes any sense you talk about that kidney punch. Why are we punching so low below the kidneys? Why do we call it that? That doesn't even make sense anymore. It's faster than species evolution. I was going to give another example that I couldn't find. It appears to have Mandela affected and jumped out of reality for the moment. So I found another one. <laughs> the one I, w I remember that I can't find, it's kind of cool, you might remember it. It was a petri dish of bacteria and they would feed it um, food that it couldn't eat. It's supposed to be a nutrient auger, but they would feed it something mm -hmm. that was lactose based and it was a lactose intolerant bacteria. So what did it do? In one generation or just a couple generations, it instantly evolved to be able to digest the lactose. I have no proof of this anymore, but I remember that study. So I anyway, oh, thank you. Okay, I figured in this room, others would also remember it. Never mind that we can't find it because now we've got this one. Now we've got fungus that can biodegrade dead and fallen trees and now digest plastic. And we were talking about manned animals and so forth earlier. So we got that going on. Anyway, your influence is much bigger than you know. You're entangled with everybody that you love, that you care about. Your observations have the power to change things. Everything you're entangled with. And we have sentience that's possible because we can realize that you're both an actor and you're observing the action. It's those levels of consciousness that I talked about. You know, the first, the primary perception and then the secondary. It's an idea from calculus, from the guy that brought us calculus. Leibniz, who also invented the pillars of science itself. Look for elegance. I see elegance in quantum physics. So this realization can occur through meditation, lucid dreaming, near-death experiences, and then there's a phrase, exceptional human experiences, that was really studied and researched before there was the Mandela effect. However, I'm sure that it would be included because it's definitely an exceptional human experience when you see the past is changing. So what are we really doing? When I'm, we've heard this this weekend. I agree, we are living, we're lucid living in a waking dream. It's that row, row, row your boat, you know, gently down the stream. We're simultaneously physically mortal egoic beings and at the same time, infinite, eternal sentient beings of imaginative possibilities equipped to walk with feet in both worlds. We can do it when we say, well, it looks like that happened, but don't worry about that. We're gonna have faith. You know, your doctor tells you some news, like my doctor told me about my daughter. My big question was, did you tell her? Don't, good. Because I'm strong enough that I'm like, oh, no worries. We're gonna be praying for this one, <laughs> big time, and it's gonna change. I know it will. I've got faith, and these things definitely change, and they do. And the reality we experience depends on subjective perspective. So when you notice that the facts and the histories are changing, and there is no such thing that we used to believe, most of us believed there was one objective reality, one truth, right? You know, tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I've been on jury duty and I tried to explain I really believe in all this. I got selected anyway. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> Seriously? And then they made me the foreman of the jury. So they know that I'm, I'm coherent, you know? I make sense, but it's like, okay, so this is kind of weird. I don't know how I ended up on that. I really don't. Because I was very clear about it. <laughs> and they're like, no, nah, you're going you're gonna to follow the rules in the court. And I said, yes, but um, I will see things change. They're like, that's fine. But, you know, <laughs> Jerry just fell out of his chair. <laughs> I know, seriously. Anyway, but everything depends on perspective. So what is this quantum reality? What are we talking about? And I love the way Jerry was asking, where do we want to go with this? Where are we going? So we can live lucidly with feet in both worlds. That's the idea. You are infinite. You're eternal. There's a part of you that knows that, that can observe whatever seems to be happening from a higher point of view. You can do this. We, we are already doing it by virtue of the fact you're experiencing Mandela effects. It's proven. Everybody here, you're doing it. And here's a fun sign. I think this is a joke, um, but I found it on the internet. Quantum Junction, get in both lanes. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> and the max speed is like the speed of light. It's kind of a joke, but, um, but for some of us, it, sometimes it feels that way. Like, wh what are you choosing? What's going on? How do you know? So we're connecting, communicating with others, other aspects of ourselves, learning to trust that intuitive heart that we never trusted before. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's hard. 
I, I worked in planning and control, uh, and one, many years later, I told they were asking, they were guessing, what do you do? What did you used to do? And I said that, and they said, no. <laughs> you weren't working in planning and control. I said, oh, yes, I was a project manager. I, mean, I planned everything. I was like type A, super planned, super organized. People were wishing twins on me. You're too organized. You should have, you should have triplets. <laughs> like, eh, no. Okay, so with galaxies, continents, and all of the organs, like the heart, I didn't get into all that, but you know the changes. They're big. Any problem can be overcome by the Mandela effect. I know it. Absolutely know it. I know it's already happening. I know we've got proof of it. I told you about Nicholas Rescher. We've got all sorts of things showing that this is happening. So we can experience the flip-flops. We can experience preferred realities. And here I'm referencing life needs and Rescher. And here's a scene from Back to the Future. Um, how do we do this? This gets fun. Okay, I promised you I'd, I'd come back to quantum Zeno effect. I'd tell you how to use it, I think. Here we go. Okay, get ready. Okay, this is fun. <laughs> okay, so steering. You want to be good at visualizing. That matters when you're steering. You don't have to aim at the pothole. You can aim high. How good can it get? I am so very blessed. You want to stay there. Fuel. Love. Gratitude. If you can hit it, go for the highest levels of reverence you can possibly feel. Just blow your socks off with that cosmic love. Just keep raising that bar. So just invite more of, more of it in. Well, how do you do that? Just love God more. Love one another more. You will, you'll get there. Breaks are quantum Zeno effect. When you find something you like, lock it in. I'll show you a little bit about that. Shifting gears, meditation, near-death experiences, lucid dreaming. Let's take a look. Okay, so steering with visualization. Here's the book I love, The World is As You Dream It by John Perkins. And here's a man who spent his early days doing terrible things to the planet. And then he had to change of heart, realize, I have really made a mess of things. Um, you know, he, he wrote books about that too. But on the good side, he writes about shamanism and prayer, um, ayahuasca, people that live by recognizing that what we dream, we can bring into reality. And this is an extraordinary way to keep that kind of faith based in a spiritual practice. And steering with visualization. Um, this picture I've included because we have often problems with our peripheral vision. And you can find yours, just wiggle your fingers at your visual edge. It's kind of fun. You can see where it is. You want to widen that out. You want to get a bigger, broader view and not get tunnel vision, which tends to happen when you panic. So when you panic, what do you do? It just shuts down and you're just in one narrow range. That's no good when you need to navigate through life. You gotta stay relaxed. It can be hard sometimes. You gotta learn to stay relaxed. Keep your vision open. And some of us feel like it's already too open. <laughs> you know, like I'm seeing too much. So you can just ask the universe, like, okay, slow it down. I think I'm getting, let's just, can we back this off a little bit? That can help. So, but it does help to get more information when it um, is along the lines of your question, which is how good can it get? Should be good information you're receiving. You also want to maintain inner harmony um, because when you cultivate harmony in yourself, then that's what you're bringing into the world. You are your message, much more than we realize. And you may think, oh, people don't know that. They don't see me. They see a lot more than you realize. We do. We see a lot more. And the, this a community especially, we really do. So harmonious alignment between what you think, what you say, what you do, is always going to bring the best, best results. You really want to be in integrity. This is a picture of my daughter who just got her PhD in cognitive neuroscience back when she was a little girl. And off in the distance, you could kind of see it way off in the distance from our house these two trees on a hill. And she kept telling me, Mom, I want to go see those trees. Let's ride our bikes out and go find them. And so I thought, I just said yes. I didn't know what I was getting myself into. I thought, well, we can see them from here. It shouldn't be too hard. Well, what happens when you travel miles down, you know, down the mountain, your way somewhere else, it's easy to get a little blocked by the forest. There literally was a forest in the way. I did not plan on that. No problem, though, because... Um, what happened, it was kind of really phenomenal. Um, I got an image kind of like the Holy Grail. I, I kid you not. With those two trees from the perspective I was in, and I knew exactly where they were and where to go. It was like the coolest thing. I was just, I just, we were riding our bikes, and I thought, oh, gosh. <laughs> There's like a forest here. I can't find these trees. I know I should be able to. They're easy to spot. 
And it was really, it was high sense perception that allowed that to happen. I can't really explain it, but it was totally excellent. And just as my family helped this dog, Prince Moonshadow, to get rid of his cataracts each time we saw they came in, we'd flip flop them back. We can switch ourselves out of almost any reality that seems to be developing. It is a miracle effect, <laughs> absolutely. And it doesn't matter how untenable that may seem. If they tell you it's impossible, never tell me the odds, like Han Solo. The fuel, as I see it, is to commune with what the scientists might call cosmic divine mind. Some people don't like the word God. Okay, whatever. But your body is woven from the light of heaven. This is a quote by Rumi and feels true to me. And it feels true to quantum physics as well. Experiencing awe is very important. This is a quote by Albert Einstein. The most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious. It is the source of all true art and all science. He to whom this emotion is a stranger, who can no longer pause to wonder and stand wrapped in awe, is as good as dead. His eyes are closed. So I think the Mandela effect is really keeping us in a state of awe. <laughs> this is a good thing. We can appreciate that. And I keep talking about reverence. You can go up a notch. Once you hit awe, keep going up. <laughs> Feel that sense that, that awe can produce, a state of reverence a feeling of respect and gratitude for the things that are given. And a state of just complete, like, it just blows your mind. Like, this is amazing. Live in reverence, if you can. And here's, I've had moments like this, not with that animal here, but with other wild animals, where you can be in that state of reverence, and wild animals know it, and they will relate to you differently. It's so cool. And then you know that the stories about saints like Francis, are true, you know, like, well, that happened. This stuff is real. And all of nature responds because it's that love and that sense of coherence and like we're family. So there's only one valid way thus to partake of the universe, whether the partaking is of food and water, the love of another, or indeed a pill. This is Dr. Larry Dossie talking. That way is characterized by reverence, a reverence born of a felt sense of participation in the universe, kinship with all others and with matter. And living in reverence, here's another great quote, we do not always see that we should be moving about our days and lives and places with awe and reverence and wonder with the same soft steps with which we enter the room of a sleeping child or the mysterious silence of a cathedral. There is no ground that is not holy ground. So what happens when you do this? I can tell you what happens. Miracles happen, literally, of every kind. I mean, I've... I keep asking, like, well, I, I think I've seen every kind of miracle, like healings and you name it. No, I hadn't seen this one. Um, in 2015, I was really, I was just sort of in a prayerful state, just meditating, praying, and just in that blissed out sense of feeling that every good thing comes from God. You ask, where does this come from? It's going to go right there at some point. I was feeling that. I got in the car, start driving, and I could feel my right tire went flat. Now, you might think, like, oh, boy, that's, this is like backwards prayer. <laughs> I didn't have any negative thoughts. I'm just like, okay, well, I better ch stop and check the car. So I pull over, and I'll check it, and it was fine. Okay, at that moment, I was in a quandary. And we know this quandary from Mandela effects. <laughs> it's like, well, wait a minute. I felt the car pulling to the right. I felt, I was hearing thwop, 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 thwop. I felt sluggishness, and, you know, everything was telling me. All my senses were telling me, I knew exactly where the flat tire should be. And now it's okay. So I get out of the car, I walk around, and I kick the tire. I don't know what to do. I feel stupid, I'm kicking a tire. Like, you hear that? And I'm doing it. I'm like, well, I don't know what to do. I guess it's okay. So I'm in a hurry, I need to get to where I'm going. And get, I start, dri I think, I'll drive slowly. Because it might still be flat, even though it looks okay. I don't know what's going on. Drive slowly, keep the window rolled down, listening. Seems fine, you know, come up to tra traffic speed, get to where I'm going, park, take out, look at the car tire, it's fine. Go to where I'm going, get back to the car, look at the tire, it's fine. Come home, look at the tire, it's, I'm looking at the tire a lot, <laughs> it's fine. And now I'm like, what the heck? So I tell my husband, uh, could you take a look at this and tell me, I don't say what's going on, but could you check the air pressure in the tires for me, because I don't know what's happening, something's happening. He comes back and he said, well, they were all, three of them were a little low. Uh, one was perfect. I'm like, no. Which one was perfect? Right front tire. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. 
So if, if that can happen, anything can happen. I, and um, my family hears about this. I tell, they've been hearing about this for 20 years. Here's my sister in the kitchen in a happy moment. It was a holiday just like um, in this kitchen, my parents' kitchen. And it was after a huge dinner, lots of dishes, tons of too many dishes for one load in the dishwasher even. Um, we push the start button with the first load and we hear this horrible clonk sound and you smell burnt oil, you know? And there's even a cloud of like fumes. <laughs> this is bad. And this had happened on a previous holiday, a couple years previous. I mean, this is, we already know what this, this is no fun. And she just looks at me and she, she says, can you do that thing you do? <laughs> and I just cracked me up. And I said, oh, this is awesome. You're making me laugh. And she's laughing too. And she's looking a little bit nervous. Like, can you do that thing you do? <laughs> I said, okay, let's do it. You know, great, we're laughing. And we're going to feel all this love for the dishwasher. And she's not exactly Christian. She studies more Buddhist traditions. So I'm just going with where she's at. And they're like, okay, let's love the dishwasher. Now we're going to know that we need it to work. We, we need it. We've got to feel that. Like, yeah, it's got to work. Picture that you're going to hear it. We're going to start it up. You're going to hear it running perfectly. Never mind what just happened. Forget that. <laughs> There's still a smell of fumes in the room. Forget that. <laughs> that did not just happen. <laughs> I don't care what it smells like. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, and so um, we're just feeling all that joy, that love. So I just open the dishwasher, shut it, push the start. This is all I'm doing. I just push the start button. And I've done this with so many devices, not just the dishwasher. Anyway, guess what happens? It starts. And it didn't stop. You know, it just worked perfectly. has not broken down, to my knowledge. This was a couple of years ago. Yeah, so it was awesome. Do that thing you do. So if you're feeling like, <laughs> if you feel like your family or friends may be kind of pushing back, just keep being yourself, be gentle, and at some point they may say that to you. In reverence, I've had spices appear in my cabinet that I know I did, in fact, I knew I did not have it. I could not find it, but I know, allow for a little bit of mystery. So I just would shut the cupboard. I need that nutmeg, I walk away, come back, check again, it's not there, shut the cupboard, walk around the house. This is important because we kind of when you walk down a hallway, you know, sometimes you don't remember what you were looking for. Imagine that you might be going through kind of like a quantum tunnel of sorts. And when you come back, you're literally in another reality. Come back in, open the cupboard. I did that like a few times. Finally, there it is. Voila. No problem. We can all do this. Uh, so the breaks. When you find something you like, how do you keep it? Well, um, this is Henry Stapp. I keep showing him. He has an orthodox quantum mechanics approach, which arises from John Van Neumann's two-step process approach. Um, basically, it's based on free will. You ask nature a question, nature answers. You ask cosmic mind or God a question, they, you get the answer. Okay, so you know how that's going. So what you get is a succession of yes, no questions and answers. And what you want to do is just keep observing that system until it seems like it's stable. So if you've got a flip-flop situation, you want to lock it in the positive side of the flip-flop, when it goes to where you want it, keep observing that. Tell people this is the one we're choosing, those who are entangled with you. I know sometimes it looks like it's doing that, but we want this one. And it, when it matters, you can get it. If it's kind of trivial, then it may not matter. And shifting gears, you want to bring attention to your awareness. So again, don't focus on those potholes. You want to breathe slowly, deeply, see the positive, invite the positive possibilities, feel awe and reverence. Pay attention to taking slow, deep, steady breaths. This lower abdominal breathing is proven to lengthen your telomeres, increase the brain cells, <laughs> increase the smart part of your brain. It, it does so many good things. It's anti-cancer, actually. If you want to fight cancer, start breathing differently. We breathe this way as babies. Martial artists, yogi masters, shamans breathe this way. Qigong masters breathe this way. And so it's a really good thing to do. So you can see the positive everywhere. You might be, uh, folk, instead of the news and getting sucked into drama there, look at what you're grateful for. Keep the bad news at the periphery. And keep inviting positive possibility. So you want to keep asking questions like, how good can it get? You will get the answer. Even if you feel like you're asking it sarcastically, it's like you just broke a whole dozen eggs on the floor. Like, how good can it get? Ask it anyway. Ask it anyway. And do it when things are going well, too. And then when you live in awe and reverence, you can start, um, try some new things, keep an open mind, see the world like it's the first time, feel part of something bigger than yourself. 
and then just keep asking, you know, how good can it get? So thank you so much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Cynthia Sue Larson. So before we start with the Q&A, I have a question. You were talking about the placebo effect, and you said they've seen a whole lot of studies, the independent doctors and whatnot. Is this across all fields, or is there one certain field they've seen more so than others? Or? Thank you. Good question. Well, it started with, um, like, there's a lot of pharmaceutical research, of course, because for, um, the placebo is being utilized as a way to show the efficacy of a drug. However, shockingly, is the placebo effect is also being proven to be effective with things like arthroscopic knee surgery and other forms of surgery. So I don't know that there's any limit to it. It seems like where they're testing it is constantly the surprise factor of, whoa. <laughs> This is weird. People thought they got the real treatment and they got better. They got a lot better than the control group. And this is with triple and quadruple, you know, really platinum standard studies where the patient doesn't know which one they're getting, the person who's performing the treatment doesn't know, and nobody involved in the process knows. And so it's all kind of locked in sealed envelopes. Then you find out like, whoa, amazing. As long as they think they're getting something, it makes a huge difference. So that's why if you tell yourself something, no matter how hard something is, like you've got this, it makes a difference. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, and you answered my next question right there at the end, because I was gonna say that's kind of what we're doing when we do the how good can it get. Exactly. If we believe it, we're creating that placebo effect within ourselves. That's right. I love it. Yeah, thank you. I absolutely <laughs> love it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, now we're going to do the Q&A. If anybody and anybody has a question, go ahead and line up at the microphone. We'd be glad to hear it. Um, so I'd like to ask some questions on um, quantum physics into um, time travel and consciousness time travel and going beyond that in time and space and to the realm of the absolute, which um, is thing beneath everything that is connected to everything. Um, what is your perspective on empowerment ways to uh, find your mode of being on that path towards seeking that truth? As a time traveler? or We're all time travelers, but you mean like um, path of truth of, of various possible yous? Or what, what's your primary <sighs> focus? <All right. laughs> what do you find... Um, waiting for a person beyond time and space. What do I find waiting for them? Well, personally, it would be this feeling of reverence with joy, you know, that cosmic mind experience of no time. You know, it's, it's that feeling of all possibility, pure consciousness, and love that's at such a level that transcends our ability to communicate it clearly. So, mm -hmm. is that what you're getting at? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Love that question. Yeah. Okay. Cynthia, thank you so much. So the question I have is really for the audience out there who may be viewing this in the future. A lot of people um, over the last 20 years, specifically the last five years, we know that um, there's a lot of dialogue about mythical creatures like unicorns reappearing in the Sams, dragons, which this year I found appearing in the Sams. But for some of us who do commune with these beings, what would be... Um, something you could say at this point in time would be helpful for all of us out there who are having um, dialogues, experiences with angels, with dragon celestial teachers, with other supposedly mythical creatures who are very real and here to help to rebirth this earth. Thank you. Excellent question. I'm going to um, see if I can go back to a slide. This really brings up Joseph Campbell, that journey. And Who is one of my favorite, favorite, favorite people in history. I wanted to meet him before he passed, but he passed in, I think, 2000. Yes. And I was in New York in 2000, yeah. Oh, well, in spirit, he's with us all. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about his ideas, so he's doubly present, right? He's really present right now. So when we talk about mythical beings, this gets into that collective unconscious. It gets into this um, realm where you cross the normal world and you go into the unknown. And you remember that quote that I had that Joseph Campbell said, the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure that you seek. So often when we get on this journey, we get to a point where 
you may encounter a wolf <laughs> and you may think what is this you may encounter a dragon it may scare the daylights out of you it probably will because on some level remember i said death and rebirth this is a normal part of a shamanic um, journey and i think those of us going through the mandela effect are going through that you'll hit a point where you're going to see things that don't make any sense at all and it's bad enough to have to talk about the mandela effect and now there's this you know like oh oh great <laughs> This is really something. So um, what do we do? I would recommend just um, to go, like Joseph says, I think it's perfect. If, you, if you're feeling that sense of fear, if you're looking at a wolf, a dragon, whatever, find the message that's there for you because there is something there for you. And you may find great strength, like in that wolf, that's, um, that's there for all of us. It's a very strong protective force. With dragons, they're amazing. Um, they're a creative force. They've been um, villainized in our planet. But if you go back to the origins of dragons, you'll find them on every single continent, every single culture. And they originally had a very positive focus. So it was kind of with the, the whole switch of the, the hemispheres of the brain. Mm -hmm. That's where the dragons kind of fell off the favor of the powers that be. And unicorns, very sacred beings too. Each of these, um, some of these were handed out on the pieces of paper, you'll notice. And Pegasus was there too. You know, they're not just regular animals, but there's that feeling that they have something for us. Thank you so much for bringing it up. And sometimes it gets into that high sense perception. So you're, feel, you're seeing colors that, you've, that you don't see on the planet, that your eyes don't process, but you can see them. You're seeing uh, the presence of animals that don't exist, but you can feel that they're quite real on some level. Yes. Thank you for that, Cynthia. And just one more question, and this is mostly for people viewing. Um, I feel this would be very helpful as well. So in this journey, some of what I've experienced, and I know many others out there have, is, you know, you see the, you see other, you know, other beings that may be not pleasant, but we know the approach is, is unconditional love. So for the person out there who's going through their awakening process, experiencing these things that may encounter, you know, they're members of our audience that, you know, have had um, experiences by beings that say that are not so positive. How, what is the best approach from a quantum approach? Not all the old rituals and magic and all the old stuff, but now the best way to like keep our sovereign matrix and not allow that to enter reality yeah. without, being, without being in a polarized state of good and bad and light and dark. Right, so the quantum approach would be look for what feels sane to you and lock it in with that quantum Zeno effect. Keep, if you, get it very grateful about the sanity, you know, about whatever feels sane to you. Is it love? Is it gratitude? Is it reverence? Lock it in. So, that, I mean, physics doesn't talk about love and gratitude and reverence, but it does talk about quantum Zeno effect. So you want to keep observing what you want more of and get stronger with it and know that that will win. Just like what we see with the placebo effect, the people that have faith are hitting this 95% efficacy of something that has no, um, no uncurative powers whatsoever. Sham surgery, fake medicine, you know. So, yeah, you can lock it in too. And you, it's not fake, it's real. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, hey, Cynthia. A comment followed by a question. The first one to say, um, where you were explaining how there's no such thing as an objective reality, that really helped me understand the message I got with the no such thing as the real world because it's like a definite article, the real world, that you could refer to a single real world. I mean, it's a very subjective experience. So I appreciate that synchronicity. Uh, the other thing is um, I recently, or I guess in 2017, I started to see the, the uh, relationship between the left and the right brain and how its relationship to computers, like the, the digital, zeros and ones would be like the left brain analytical but then we're trying to move into quantum computers which is more like our right brain is what i was saying can you um comment on that sure thanks for bringing that up so yes um that's a good point so quantum you can think of quantum processing and computers as dealing with possibilities and you can think of your intuitive mind as dealing with possibilities and I don't have the quote in this talk, but I had it on Friday where I was quoting the work of Jerome Busemeyer from Quantum Cognition and Decision. And he's talking in that book about when you are observing possibilities, it's, in, it's the spread out wave function smeared all over the place. It's all possibility out there. And then when you make your observation, you can lock it in. 
We know this intuitively. This is the way we can, this is how I did quantum physics problems at UC Berkeley. I loved it um, because in quantum physics, you just write the answer down. I don't have to show, it's like you just write down what's the wave state of this function. Here it is. And I knew it. And it's like, I like this stuff. And then, that was my first taste. Like this is kind of cool. This is, this does match intuition exactly. So I think it's a perfect um, kind of an analogy of that left brain, right brain, and recognizing that when you're in the intuitive state of mind, it's very quantum, very natural. This is the way nature works. And sometimes what's interesting is when you get the, this little conflict going, mm -hmm. you've got, yeah, I, think, I think most of us know what that feels like. So one part of you is like, but it, we do it this way. That's the right way to do it. And then your intuitive is saying, no, I need to, I need to do something else right now. So start trusting that intuitive voice. I think most of us who are here have been learning to do that, and I, I loved your talk focusing on that. <laughs> Thanks so much. I also wanted to mention um, unicorns is in the Bible now. Yay! <laughs> yes. I went through the Book of Psalms in uh, September, and unicorns are now in Psalms. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. She says uh, unicorns are now in the Book of Psalms. They're doubling. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to bring up an issue with climate change and that I've seen, um, according to Lone Eagle's channel and how he does geography, the planet Earth has gotten smaller, and I've definitely noticed that. You know, the ice caps are gone. Um, I was just wondering if you could give us any advice on how to help the Earth yes. get back to a better state because I feel like we are running out of time very quickly. Good question. Love it. And uh, th I meant to touch on this when I was talking about the, the study that vanished about the nutrient auger that was non-nutritious. And we're in a similar state for all of us to, um, we need to, we're in a crisis basically. Humanity is in a crisis state where we're feeling like things are out of control and we don't know what to do about it. But this is a point where evolution can occur. And I think um, Lauren was talking about that, that often when you have a trauma, that can be an incentive to an evolutionary jump. And that's exactly right. That's what we see. Uh, with these sudden um, evolutionary jumps that are happening with punctuated equilibrium. And the plastic eating. Yes, eating and I could yeah. find that one. So uh, yeah, things can instantly change. And when you know that, and you know that things can happen through faith and through reverence and the fact that we can learn, we're the ones that need to not panic. We're the ones that know you can have these two possible pasts. And you can see flip-flops, and maybe uh, we're the ones that are going to pick up the steering on this planet Earth, this spaceship Earth. And we're doing it together, so, and we're learning to drive it together. You remember when you first learned to drive a stick shift? Um, if you ever did, yeah. <laughs> I don't miss it. <laughs> a lot of mistakes. I think we're in that phase right now, so don't panic. Okay, thank you. Uh, fantastic presentation. Thank you very much. Um, you mentioned, and I was extremely excited that you actually had steps on how to make this happen. Yes. Uh, you mentioned visualization and the tools of uh, empowering it with love, reverence, and gratitude. Yes. Uh, so right before this conversation, or right before the presentation, we looked at that article by Matthew Fisher about the quantum brain and how there's the micro tubules. Yes. So on, on a scientific level, on a uh, brain level of being able to do like the qubits within the brain, uh, you mentioned in your discussion using love and reverence. Uh, is there anything else you could tell us on like a scientific or technical level of how to increase that state in our own brains, such as meditation or chemicals or medicine or exercises, yoga? What would you say would be the way to improve our ability to do these things? Yeah, that's a great question, too. Thank you. Um, so um, basically, this is a big question, like how can you do that? It's an individual answer, like each one of us has a different ideal diet. We don't all eat the same food. Um, but you can find the right combination of exercise, meditation, rest, diet, um, focus of attention. Find your own set of practices. and. Try different things that seem to work for you. Try the kind of software that you've developed even, you know, to t fine tune that theta state awareness that you can start moving things. That's brilliant. Um, anything like that would, could be a good tool. Some people prefer just um, blissing out to music, finding that harmonious healing frequency. 
the solfeggios that Lauren was talking about. So it could be very individual. But when you find something you know it, you can kind of feel it in yourself. Like, this works for me. And then you're getting a piece of that. And just keep building it together. Put it together. Thank you. Thank you. I'm standing there trying to think of how to phrase this question, and I still don't have it. It's a, it's a difficult one, but it's for three years now, I know a lot of people have had this question. And I have an answer for myself, but if I was in your shoes, I don't know if I would know how to articulate it very well. A lot of, in the last three years, many times I've gone through something was one way and the world just changed on me. And then the friends, co-workers, family, I would say, do you remember us talking about this last week and how I remembered this thing and it was this way? And well, guess what? Now it's, it's changed. It's flip-flopped. Right. No memory. No memory of the conversation. Nothing left on blogs anymore where I left comments. No videos. Things like that. It's all gone. And I, I know a lot of people in the community, not everybody believes in like multiple realities. They think this single place is being modified. Somebody's in some magical computer making alterations, but I, t I tend to lean towards the multiple reality because of just the bizarre way in which so many things have changed and then everything was different for me so many times. So the question that I'm leading up to and so many people have wigged out about is, okay, if my reality, if I bounced over from here to the, right over there, is this still my wife? Is this still my friend? Is, are they the same people, or am I in a whole new realm? That's, I mean, it's a valid question. And I do have that worked out for me, but I'm just wondering how others might go there, get their mind around that. That's a good question. I like it. Um, so um, thank you so much for asking. And the way I'm looking, and stay there, because then you can say what you think after. We'll, we'll have a dialogue, if you don't mind. So what I notice is that, like I'm talking about this living with uh, feet in two worlds, you're both this conscience, conscious sentient being aware of your awareness, and then you're this physical animal that's kind of afraid to die, and you don't want to get sick, and you know, we've got all these ego issues, and we're the ones that get fearful and scared of things. Your infinite eternal self is not like that. So when you start recognizing that you've got both, um, this, uh, some sort of extraordinary thing can happen right there. And not everybody has this. So a lot of people don't know what I'm talking about right now, and I know that. I know it's going to sound far-fetched, but um, bear with me. So once you've got that and you recognize, okay, um, we all have that infinite eternal consciousness, then you can feel safe knowing that you, the people that you really love, you're loving them on that infinite eternal basis. You are loving them forever. And that's what real love is. If you're only loving them because they have money or they're beautiful or they're young, well, you know, this is not what we learn from a spiritual path, is it? And there's a reason for that. We are getting the opportunity to learn for sure that we need to look deeper and feel deeper and know for sure, like, this is the person I love. And maybe they've changed a little bit, but I'm going to roll with it and see where that goes and have faith. That's what I would say. Oh, I don't know what you would say. I'd love to hear it. <laughs> there was this goofy movie about these guys that uh, were workout crazy I can't remember the name right now but they got busted in a crime they did a murder and all that and uh, we watched it as a family my son my wife and I watched it like a week pri a week ago let's just say I, I thought it was funny laughed at it my wife thought it was stupid humor a week goes by, she comes home with that same movie, ready to watch that movie. That you've already seen, that you know she doesn't like. I said, we've already watched this. My son said, yeah, we've already watched this. Don't you remember? I said, I'll let her play it. She'll, it'll come. She'll, as soon as she sees it, we're watching. Ten minutes go by. Are you not remembering any of this? My son and I are laughing because it's like, how do you not remember? This was a week ago. And she's getting mad. She thinks we're making fun of her. But... I'm Mandela affected by now already, and I'm beginning to wonder, did something happen here? Did I move and she's not, you know, it, it's weird when stuff like that happens. And I have, I've come to, in the same way that reality kind of 
rather than thinking a hard line like path A and path B, which is so many, or path C and D and E, just looking at it as, as like a frequency of a radio that I've just turned into, and maybe I'm tuning into reality B, but A and C are still there. They're just not as sharply focused. So I've looked at the people as being very similar in a sense. I've tuned into person B, but A and C are still there. They're not gone. They're just, I'm tuning into this one right here that's focused like that. And all the aspects of my wife, my friend, my coworker, all aspects of them in every version of reality is still them. I'm just zoning into this part of them. Yeah, you're seeing a piece. The physical p manifestation is just a, that's the tiny, it's the tip of the iceberg. Right. So the infinite the eternal images. self, that's the, that's the bigger. And the, in fullness. a larger sense, they are, yeah. right. In a larger sense, they're still you, them. You can't lose them. Right. You can't lose right. them. You're, that's how I've come to grips. Excellent. But I know a lot of people have freaked out in the community over this. I don't know if I'm still married to the same person, you know, that whole... I got a, a, and when I started my website, that was a lot of what I was hearing 20 years ago. Um, like, they, they're seeing changes, and they're like, am I, my husband, their eyes are different, their, their face is different. Doesn't, like, catch up anymore? Who, who are they? <laughs> yeah, right. And they were freaking out, and they were so grateful at that time that I was sharing these firsthand accounts, because they'd read it, and they'd say, oh, it's at least there are other people feeling this. This is still pretty freaky, but, and, and I think that's the value of YouTube channels, you know, where you, where yeah. you share that, and we and we have other people say, "I know what you're going through," and thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank you. I wanted to hear your perspective thank because you. that's been a big question. Oh, I love the question. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, Cynthia. Hello. I want to say that I really enjoyed your presentation. I really enjoy how you bring quantum physics into it. I really enjoy your channel, how you're always talking about the latest research that's coming out with quantum physics. I think it's awesome how these things get tied in. So I have a question about the quantum Zeno effect. Yeah. So on my channel, I made um, these two videos about Gilligan's Island. Mm -hmm. And part of the thing that was crucial to it, by the way, I might call this part three of my Gilligan's Island video right now. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that was crucial to it was that when I started watching it again, I noticed that everyone had green eyes except for the millionaire. And then... As the video got out and people were watching it, people's eye color, like, for example, Marianne, turned back to brown. It was very interesting. And people were commenting, how come you're saying this person has green eyes? I, they clearly have brown eyes. And then other people started commenting that Marianne has always had bright green eyes. Like, how could you ever say that she had brown eyes? So people were going back and forth with their comments. And I would go online and look at their pictures again because I was trying to carefully research everything, not to do anything wrong and look at multiple pictures. I even saw, after I put the video out, I saw one picture where Marianne had half brown and half green eyes. I don't know how that happened. So when you talk about the quantum Zeno effect, how could you tie that into what people are observing with the eye color of that cast on Gilligan's Island? Excellent question. Okay, and you remember I also talked about some other quantum effects you see in nature, such as the two-step process that sheepdogs use to gain coherence in a herd of sheep. First, you gather them together, and then you drive them in the direction that you desire. What we observe with Mandela effects is not so much um, usually. We don't tend to get um, driven directions where we're hoping or trying to get an effect. We're getting collective unconsciousness bubbling up with all different levels of uh, groupings, if you will, of these uh, I'm not going to call them sheep, but, you know, people who have um, one bias or another. And as they start t focusing their attention on your video, and this whole matter and this question comes up to the focal point, then they're bringing with them their internal bias and their observation of the observation. So you're getting some quantum steering occurring with uh, coherence and entanglement, lots of factors. It's this really cool kind of a quantum game, which we don't have yet, but it would be cool if we did where you can kind of get a feeling for how do you do this? How do you steer out of global warming or what, it, what have you? That's a very interesting way to look at it too. Almost like a game that changes people's consciousness right. and awareness and steers them into a s specific direction. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, awesome. Well, thank you for that information. And let's try to lock in the green eye color because everything else is getting too confusing. I love so, it. <laughs> all right, thank you. Thank you. All right, anybody else have any questions? <clears throat> I think that was an absolutely wonderful talk. I learned a lot, a lot of information I did not know.
a lot of new physics information from these, some of these scientists. I can't wait to see where the, uh, it leads. So thank you so much, Cynthia, for being here this weekend for both talks. It's been absolutely amazing. We really appreciate it.